interesting thing about worship this morning. In the middle of the week, I was working on my message, and I thought there would be a song we haven't done for a long, long time. I, I should call Paul and see if he knows that song so we could sing it this morning. And I didn't have Paul's phone number, and I didn't get around to finding his phone number, so I figured that's all right. And it was the song, uh, Jesus, Holy and Anointed One. <laughs> I haven't heard that one for a long time. And so we certainly pray that the Lord Jesus would be lifted high and that his word would deeply resonate within our innermost being. And we continue our study of First John this morning. First John 5, 1 through 5. But before we look at that text, I want to tell this story. Marie and I have been members of a fitness club for many years. Here's a paragraph from our club's mission statement. And listen carefully if any part of this mission statement uh, corresponds to a need that you feel in yourself. Uh, don't worry, this is not a commercial, by the way. We're not, we don't have a table set up outside to enroll you as new members. I'm not even going to mention the name of the club. Our philosophy takes into account all aspects of your lifestyle in and outside the gym to discover and uncover the best version of you. We ignite your passion, challenge your understanding, and expand your expectations. We believe that in order to move forward, you must access your mindset, nourish your body, and regenerate your soul. Sounds like a church. <laughs> They've never taken offering there, but uh, maybe they should. We know what you achieve in here leads to an even better you out there. We empower you to get what you really want and live your best life now. It's our recipe to help you become your best self. Marie and I have been going to that gym for 16 years now. It's a regular part of our weekly schedule. And we still haven't discovered the best part of ourselves in that gym. <laughs> Maybe I should ask for some of our money back. <laughs> but I have found the best part of myself in this book, especially in the particular part of this book that we've been studying the last several weeks, First John. And so today we're going to be in 1 John chapter 5 and be thinking again about what does this say about the best part of you, the better version of yourself. So if we could have the first slide up, please. Just follow along with me as I read. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? <clears throat> now, when we read this section, 
we get a sense of deja vu. Haven't we covered this ground before? Is there anything that John is saying that we haven't heard before? And the answer is yes, we have covered this ground before. Many times. There is nothing in this text that we haven't heard already. And what John is doing here is he's summarizing what he has written so far as kind of a springboard to the final section of his letter. John weaves together the three main characteristics of the children of God. Belief, love, and obedience. Let's see the second frame, or the second uh, slide. We notice that verse 1 and verse 5 form kind of a frame for the text. Uh, the frame kind of focuses our attention on the center. The first verse says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And that is echoed in verse 5, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And so what John has been saying in our study of 1 John in virtually every section of his letter, that the truth about Jesus Christ matters. But not just the truth about Jesus Christ, because a person can believe the truth about Christ, what the Bible reveals to us about his true nature and his mission. But what the Bible also requires is a commitment to that truth. And that's the word that John uses is belief or faith. Our faith in the truth about Jesus is of crucial importance. And John is simply re-emphasizing that uh, for us in this particular text. In verse 1, uh, he speaks of everyone who loves the Father, loves whoever has been born of him. The word everyone makes it all-encompassing of all Christians, all believers, everywhere, throughout all time, in all parts of the world, no matter what language they speak no matter what culture they're a part of, no matter what nation they live in. But he narrows the focus in verse 5 to the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Actually, it's a, it's a, it could be translated the one believing that Jesus is the Son of God. So he, he narrows it from everybody to you and me to each individual here. And that of crucial importance to us is our faith in the person of Jesus Christ. But this faith isn't simply enough. We don't simply say we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that we believe that he is the Messiah, he is believe, believes my, my, he's, that he's my Savior. And the result of that is that we are born of God. This is the expression that John uses, that we typically use the expression today, borrowing from Jesus' own words, we have been born again. Uh, on a Sunday morning in July of 1970, I woke up and I was one person. And by the end of the day, I was a totally different person because my brother uh, came into my room uh, we were home from college uh, for summer break. My brother came into my room and said, would you like to go to church with me today? And I looked out the window to see if the sun was shining and didn't seem like anything better to do at the moment. So I went up to church, went up Park Avenue, Thurston Middle School, and there, Calvary Evangelical Free Church, which is the former name of Church by the Sea. There they were having their worship service. I believe it was in the library or maybe it was the cafeteria. And it was at that service that I gave my life to Christ in response to an invitation by the pastor, Pastor Ted Lepper. And by the time we drove down the hill, I was a child of God. I was an infant, I was a baby, I didn't know anything except that I had just surrendered my life to Christ. Do you remember that day when you surrendered your life to Christ? 
Uh, how many of you, by the way, I'm just curious, is there anyone else here who that occurred as a, in participation of our little church? Did any of you come to Christ in this, this church? Yvette. Wow. Anyone else? It's you and me, Yvette. <laughs> We're not only children of God, we are children, offspring of this church. We are part of the story of this church from start to finish. And so he says our faith is very important. But love is important too. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father as children would love their own parent. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. In other words, if we say that we love the Father, and this was John, uh, the message that John had last week that Jeff preached, we cannot say that we love the Father, but we don't love his family. In fact, John says if we say that, we're liars. These two go together. And John is not saying this for the first time. He's said it often. And he wants to say it one more time to remind us that we are part of a family. We each come to Christ one by one, and we bear something of the character of our Father, but we also bear something of the character of his family. We are family. If we love the Father, we love each other. Uh, there's a third thing, however, he stresses, and that is that the idea of obedience. Faith is important. Love is important. Obedience is important. And we see that highlighted in verses 2 and 3 in the center. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Uh, notice he doesn't use a word that means uh, his friendly advice, his guidelines for success, <laughs> key to a happy life. He uses the word commandments. We are under orders. It is our duty as ones who have been born of God to love God, but also to love one another. Now that helps set our priorities. It doesn't say anything here about we love the people that love us. We love the people that we like or get along with or who agree with us. We love only the people that voted Democrat or Republican. We love the people who look like us or talk like us or live in the same place as us. No, we are to love the family of God. These two go together. And this requires obedience to the word of God. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Now, the beautiful thing <clears throat> about these commandments is <clears throat> that they are doable. Now, if God's commandments seemed impossible, difficult, and they are, John says, no worries. Because as people who have a regenerated nature, people born of God, we have a capacity to obey the word of God that we didn't have before through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And as difficult as may seem and, and as uh, unreasonable as the request is to love your, our neighbors, to love people that we find unlovely, or people we wouldn't choose to be our friends in any other circumstance, we find that in Jesus' view and in John's view, these commandments don't crush us. They are not overwhelming us. 
They are not burdensome. It doesn't help me much if a person says to me something along the line or conveys the idea that, you know, I'm, I'm committed to loving you, although it sure is hard. <laughs> Oof, I'm exhausted. What a burden you are to me. When in my dad's final weeks before he died, uh, he was um, totally incapacitated. He couldn't do anything for himself. And all he kept saying was, I, I just don't want to be a burden. I just don't want to be a burden. He, he wasn't a burden, but in, he was. But you are given grace when you need it. When the burden seems so heavy that it's about to crush you, we read the encouragement in this passage, his commandments are not burdensome. And the commandments are tethered to our connection with each other in the family of God. And for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Now this is a powerful word. It is one of John's favorite words. In fact, it is used 17 times in the book of Revelation. Overcomers, or literally the phrase is the ones overcoming, in the book of Revelation is a synonym for Christian. The other two words that are frequently used in Revelation that are synonyms for Christian are witness and servant. So we are servant witnesses, the ones overcoming. We are overcoming because the victory that has already been won by Christ over the, our greatest enemies of sin, death, and the devil. In this sense, Christians are winners. We are not losers. We are victorious to the extent that we stay connected to the one who brought us that victory, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we find in these verses simply a summary of what John has already said. And we ask ourselves the question, how are we doing at being obedient? Are we obedient children of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and His Father? Uh, Marie likes to tell a story about our daughter Jenny when she was an infant, she would be in her bed She'd be looking at her hand and saying, I say obey, obey. And she would want her, you know, she would command herself to obey what her mind was telling her to do, which was probably what her parents were saying she was supposed to do. But we obey when we love the people that we are connected to. 1 Peter 1, 22-23 says, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. That purification of the souls uh, is what John is describing as being born of God. Since you have done this, fervently love one another from the heart, for you have been born again. Not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. Fervently love one another from the heart. I love this word, fervent. Uh, fervent has the idea of passionate, of strong, of deep. Uh, the Greek word is a compound word. Ek, out. Tenos, stretch. Tenos is the word that we get tendency from. Tenos is the word that we get tendon from. It is the nature of agape love to stretch. Out, stretched love. How far can you stretch? Ugh! Until you feel like you're going to break. I think what Peter is saying is just keep stretching. 
That's the nature of the kind of quality of love that God's people are to have for one another. What I love about this text is that this word overcome means that the new birth has taken us out of the sphere of the world where Satan rules. The spell of the old life has been broken. If we succumb again to that spell, it's because of our own carelessness, our own doing. But the capacity is there to live in a whole different realm. To believe that Jesus has been victorious over sin. And have access to the power that enables us to win our daily battles. What a wonderful promise is given here. Colossians 1, 12 through 14 says, And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, I've always found Christ's letter to the church in Ephesus in the seven letters, uh, the letters to the seven letters in Revelation 2, 1 through 7. The letter to the Ephesus church, which is the first letter, the first church that Jesus addresses, this is the most chilling for me of all seven letters, even more than the last one, the Laodicean church. Jesus commends the church for what they're doing well. If we imagine little boxes, let's check the boxes. How's their theology? They have impeccable orthodoxy. Check. The hard work was there. Check. The courageous endurance was there. Check. This was a busy, diligent, conscientious, Bible-believing group of folks. And Jesus has only one complaint about the Ephesian believers, but it is a, sheer, a serious shortcoming. And it's introduced by the word, but. You know, somebody is listing all of your virtues. Long list, and then there's a pause. And you're thinking, oh, here it comes. <laughs> but I have this against you. And you go, ooh, brace yourself. You have forsaken your first love. The word forsaken means abandoned ditched me, this church of impeccable theology, this church of hard-working, orthodox, resilient, persevering Christians. And Jesus warns them if they do not repent, he will come and remove their lampstand. And we might say, well, isn't two out of three good enough? Our theology, our perseverance, our, our hard work, look at the sweat on our, on our foreheads. When Marie and I were in India, whenever we would be taken someplace by the bicycle taxis, the way that the fee was negotiated by the amount of sweat on the, your taxi driver's uh, forehead, he would point to his head and if he's dripping with sweat, more rupees. We can't point to the sweat on our forehead and say, aren't you pleased? Where there is no love, there will be no light. No amount of orthodoxy or good works or perseverance can make up for a failure to love. Jesus says, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and I'm going to remove your lampstand. No light no life, no love, no light, 
no church. Jesus warned his disciples that at the end of the age, as it draws near, quote, lawlessness will be increased and the love of many will grow cold. I pray that that would never be true of, of us. Now, the rest of my sermon I want to share as a kind of a, a very personal and up until this moment a private uh, story of an experience that I had in August of 2004. Because it has, I believe, a bearing on what I learned about love, about the need to stretch in love, about the priority of love, on a trip that I took to Ukraine. I've been listening to the news just as you have and filled with anxiety and concern and I've heard Christians um, make statements like, uh, this is obviously a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. I've heard others blame someone or another for why we have this problem today. But that's not at all how I am processing the news. And when I tell you my story, you'll see why. We were invited, our school, Harvest Bible University in Los Angeles, was invited to start an extension campus in Kyiv, the capital city of Ukraine. My dean was supposed to go. He was unable to go, and he asked me to go in his place, representing the school and teaching a 10-day intensive course uh, in Kyiv. There were three of us on the team. One of us was a Korean, a good friend of mine. When we arrived in Kyiv, we were meet, met at the airport by the missionaries who had invited us. The missionaries were Koreans. I have a great fondness and affection for Koreans, and I have many Korean friends. I've made many trips to South Korea, so I, I love Korean people. I don't love kimchi yet, but I'm working on that. <laughs> we got off the plane, and we were really tired. We'd been all traveling for about 20 hours without any sleep. And the missionaries put us into a van, and we started driving into the south of Ukraine. It was a Sunday. We were headed for a city called Kirovohrad. The names of Ukrainian cities keep changing uh, because Ukrainian people are always wanting to Ukrainianize the city names. So city names that formerly had Russian names now have Ukrainian names. This city is located in south central part of Ukraine. We pass miles and miles of birch forests, cornfields, and fields ablaze with sunflowers. It rained off and on for the week we were there, a blessing because Ukraine is known for its hot, humid summers. And the classroom that we used was not air-conditioned. We got to Kirova Rod. There was a church we were going to be ministering in. It was quite a large church by Ukrainian standards. We sat down in the front row and the Korean missionary whispered in my ear, by the way, Pastor Steve, you're preaching. <laughs> First of all, you have to understand about me that I am a reluctant leader, and I like lots of time to prepare. <laughs> I feel very insecure when I don't have my notes in front of me. So I did not have a message. The worship started, I bowed my head, and normally in this situation I would pray, Lord, give me a message, because I got nothing. Instead, I prayed, Lord, would you give me your heart 
for the Ukrainian people. And I started to sob. I didn't know why. My friend Young Park, my Korean partner, said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I don't know what's happening to me. The sobbing did not come from a hurt place in me. It came from someplace else. It was like something that was imparted. I wasn't sad. I wasn't re it wasn't a trigger for some past loss or pain. It was just flooding me with, oh Lord. I don't, I don't ask that much anymore because I'm afraid. <laughs> it's a dangerous prayer. Lord, would you give me your heart for this person or for these people? Bruce, I believe you and Linda have asked that prayer in your own fashion for the Thai people. Bruce starts to cry whenever you just mention Thailand. I sobbed and sobbed. I felt the pain of the people. And I didn't have a message. I, I didn't know what to do. I just... If God's heart is broken for the people you pray for, you'll receive God's broken heart. God's heart is broken for the person you're praying for. You, you will receive God's broken heart. Worship continued, and I sobbed and sobbed, and the next thing I knew, someone was tapping me on the shoulder. Pastor Steve, it's time to preach. And I was a mess, and I got up, and I was walking up the steps to the podium where the pulpit was, and I still didn't have a message. I didn't know what was going to come out of my mouth when I started to preach. This is the private part that I'm sharing with you. I got up to the pulpit and I had, God gave me a vision. And I just kind of shut my eyes and I downloaded the vision part by part. It was in English, of course, but I had a translator. The vision was I saw water flowing out of the pulpit of that church down the aisle and out the door. It was clear, crystal clear water. It flowed out of the church and into the streets. And wherever the water flowed, it, turned, it brought life uh, to dead plants, to alcoholics, uh, the Ukraine problem with alcoholism is huge. You see them everywhere when you're in a city. And so alcoholics being healed and set free by partaking of the water. The water flowed down the streets and into the river. And the river was brown water, but where the water, the living water flowed, the crystal turned everything crystal clear. And it flowed down the river southward and into the Black Sea. And as it flowed into the Black Sea, it turned the sea into crystal clear water. And it spread all the way across to the south shore, which is Turkey. And people were coming down to the shore with their buckets and pans and canteens. And they were harvesting the living water and taking it home. That's all I had, and I sat down. The pastor of that church stood up. And um, he bowed his head and was shaking it like this, and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> That's what happens when you preach on, without sleeping for 24 hours. <laughs> I was sitting next to my translator. And he said, kept saying, I'm flabbergasted. I'm flabbergasted. This is translating what the pastor was saying. 
Apparently there is a Russian word that means flabbergasted. <laughs> I was amazed that my translator knew that word, flabbergasted. I said, I'm flabbergasted. This is the exact vision that God gave me some years ago. Do you remember? And yet we abandoned the vision because we didn't feel that we had the resources to carry it out, namely to have a mission to Turkey. I was so relieved that my part of the service was over. Next thing I knew, <laughs> the pastor says, Pastor Steve, come on up here. <clears throat> so I brought my two partners with me and we stood up there and people came forward for prayer and long lines of people came forward. One translator between the three of us, so I was standing there, long line of people weeping, uh, many females, crying out in Russian or Ukrainian, and I'm listening, I'm going like this as if I understand what they're saying, you know, mm-hmm, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, what am I doing up here? You know, this is insane. Finally, I gave up, I just started praying in the Spirit. I didn't know what I was doing, and then some of these people were falling down and obviously being touched by God. And the translator came by, listened to me praying in the Spirit, and he said, Oh, you're praying for ladies' problems. <laughs> he didn't know the English word gynecological. And I'm thinking, what am I doing up here? <laughs> And I was praying for one lady after another, or crying and being, it was an awesome experience. And I thought, well, that's it. I'm done for the week. I'm just going <laughs> to. When the classes started, we had 38 students, all pastors from all over Ukraine, all men. My course was on character development. And I emphasized uh, control of the tongue, uh, giving and receiving reproof and the power of forgiveness. The students would sit as if they were carved out of stone. No facial expression, no apparent response, no taking notes, no motion. They were just frozen like this. And, and uh, all three of us had this experience as we were teaching. I asked my interpreter, are we missing something here? Are we not connecting? Is it because we're Americans? This was not long after our invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. And he explained that this is typical classroom demeanor for men who were trained under the Soviet system. Don't take it personally. This is just the way that they learn. In between my class and the next, they brought in a worship team. A couple females and the rest were guys. And typical, you know, guitars, drums, the whole works. The music started. Suddenly, the men carved out of stone, leapt to their feet, and started shouting, Slava Boga! Slava Boga! I nudged my interpreter, what is that? I thought maybe lunchtime or, you know. <laughs> it means praise God in Russian. I've never seen worship like this. They were like, what you imagine Cossack dancers doing, throwing their legs out, their arms in the air in unison, you know, rocking and rolling and jumping and dancing and singing, and the whole room was rattling. And then the worship stops and whoop, back to stone. <laughs> oh. I went up after my teaching session and went up and they had provided a room for us in this kind of dormitory and a little bed where we could lie down and rest. And I went in there and was grateful for the time to rest and kind of think about what's going on here. And 
I turned on a CD. It's this CD. It's called Lift Up Your Heads, Worship Music from Calvary Evangelical Free Church of Laguna Beach, Church by the Sea. I was playing the music, listening to the music, and I woke up and I suddenly, the room was filled with Ukrainians. You, you, it was the worship team. They heard the music. They were following the music. Where is that music coming from? Where is it? And they found my room and they were all standing there. And, and I brought several of these. And I said, would you like one of these? And oh, yes, yes. And I like to think that this is being used in the Ukrainian church today. I like my friend uh, Terry Ryan whose music is on this, to come forward and just share a little bit about the story of this. And this is an impact our little church is having on Ukraine today. I'm not, I'm not used to giving public speeches either, so bear with me. And Carol and I, uh, my wife, uh, we joined this church in the spring of 1990. And um, Carol was a born again, a second time Christian at that time. She, she'd been a, a, a asked the Lord into her life as an early girl when she was young. I was a brand new Christian. And from that point forward, Steve, Steve was my mentor in any walk that I had. Um, so, so after about a year and a half, which would be late 91, um, I joined the worship team, um, and Brad Coleman was the primary worship leader at that time. I think many of you remember him. He hadn't been gone that long. And, um, and so what we did is, is we, it, it turns out by 1992, I, was, I started being given a lot of original songs, Christian songs, primarily out of the Book of Psalms, and, um, but also throughout other parts of the, of the uh, of the Bible, and it surprised me more than anybody else because I've been playing guitar and singing since I was a kid, and so all of it. But I never really written any music; had no desire to. I just did cover music my whole life. So here I am writing new music, and and then Brad also during that period of time began. Uh, he he'd written before, but he started writing a lot more. So here we have two worship leaders in this church writing a bunch of original music. So that went on for several years. Um, that through from 91, 92 is, is where it began. It got, it probably until 94, 95, there was a lot of music being written and we were playing that music in this church as it came. There would be times literally on a Wednesday, we would rehearse and we would bring a new song on Wednesday, one of us, and we would sing that on the following Sunday. Uh, we just felt like God has given this music to us for a reason, and so let's let's sing it, and so we did that. But by uh, by the end of that decade, by about 98, 97, 98, we'd been we started talking about um, maybe we should put this in a in a CD format because there's a lot happening here, and maybe this is a way for us to 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 bless the, the congregation. So we did. Uh, so at the beginning of the year 99, we began this CD. Um, Brad did all of the, the producing. Carol and I did the funding of the thing, and we all participated in the in the doing of it, if you will. Brad's wife, Margie, did the uh, did the graphics on it. She did a really good job. <clears throat> and um, uh, we did the vocals at Brad's house um, up the hill from here, and we did the actual uh, instrumental part right in this sanctuary. We just found a day when there wasn't a lot of pounding going around in the neighborhood and, uh, and obviously excluded everybody else from the church for, a, for an afternoon. And his band, uh, Mercy Miles, some of you may remember his band, um, great, great musicians. They did the bulk of the music. Of course, Brad and I did guitar work on it. So, um, and Felicia Kieswetter, I don't know if she's here today, but she was also on that, on this CD and one of her songs appears on it. So the, the CD was, a, was uh, about 50-50 of music I wrote and music Brad wrote. 
And, um, and so that's kind of the background of it. We, we made, um, at the time we made 5,000 copies and we handed them out, you know, like hotcakes, just basically that we felt like that's, that's what we should do. And over the years, we've given the bulk of them away. I have a few left at home up in Whidbey Island. I know Brad has given them away in, in uh, Illinois mm. the last several years. But uh, they're, they're, uh, I, I, like Steve, would like to believe, we don't know this for sure, but, we would, but I know that the people in Romania especially uh, were, were uh, very interested in this. And, and the Ukrainians, I'm sure, mm. the same thing. So it was just an example of God touching two men in this church and just flooding us with, with what I'd like to, to think is really good music, because it is. And I, and I say that knowing full well that none of this came from me. I was simply, a, 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 I was simply being used by the Holy Spirit to, to birth this music. And that's an amazing privilege. And so I don't, create, I don't take that credit, nor does Brad. That's just kind of how we look at it, and I think it's true. So with that said, I think, Steve, mm -hmm. uh, that gives you the background in mm -hmm. this particular. Yeah, thing. thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Boy, that's the, that's the universal language, isn't it? Music, especially worship music. I love that story. By the end of the week, I was asking the students to pray for me because I wanted what they had. But that's another story. If we could have the third slide. Three questions. Number one, are you willing to ask God to impart to you his heart for a particular person or people group? But watch out. Number two, is there a person or persons for whom our Lord's commandment to love one another, you are finding it to be especially difficult or burdensome at this time? Perhaps it's someone in your own family or your own neighborhood or your own church. How does the love of God empower you to overcome this difficulty or bear this burden? And number three, what action will you take to be obedient to the commandment to love the children of God? What unbelief, fear, or resistance in yourself will it be necessary for you to overcome in order to obey God's commandment and thus show yourself to be truly born of God? <laughs> 